Nerd Rage Relegates. Welcome to the Nerd Rage Renegades. We are back amidst uh, me being in a coma for the last couple days. Yeah. Sick. <laughs> you're, you're hard to find. <laughs> Dude, I was like, it, it was that sickness where it's like your whole head just feels like it's like full of mush. Oh, yeah. You know, and your sinuses are like, it, it just, it, it's like that thing where you're sick and like everything that goes in your mouth like drink or food wise t- tastes off it yeah tastes, everything's like, it's, it's horrible it's like horrible <laughs> and you wake up and your mouth is so dry and it's like you know you're like it feels like like there's stuff all on your gums and you're like mm, ah, mm, ah. well i was just being lazy for like uh, three days straight because you were sick and i said like, well i'm gonna take this opportunity to fucking sleep too (laughs) so i slept a lot too so it seemed like every time you were awake i was asleep and every time i was awake you were asleep so my my luckily you read a bunch of the books because i've read one because i've just been up and down sleeping for like all weekend yeah yeah. i read uh let's see uh we'll get to that we'll get to it later but i read uh i read about four or five of them all right i read the most important one i read batman so when we get there i read batman so that's i got batman we can uh we can do long this well there's a lot to discuss about that batman there's a lot of shit going on there's a lot. Um, now, I will say, before I went down, before I went down in a heap of... Before I went to Slumberland and met Flip and King Morpheus and fought the Nightmare King with the oomps and all this <laughs> other good stuff, um, I took Friday off of work. And uh, honestly, it was, a, it, was, it was a good thing I did. It was a good thing I did. A couple reasons. One, I got a, I got a call for a new job interview. For a new job, uh, you know, I, I, and now I'm not going to say what it is because, you know, I keep my, that kind of stuff personal, kind of private, but I am excited for it. I'm nervous for it. And let me just tell you, going out and buying a fucking suit for an interview is fucking bullshit. And it's not really, uh, it's within your same vein of what you do now. Yeah. It's, it's still within the, it's not like a completely different No, thing. but so I had to go out today and I had to buy a suit. I had to get a suit jacket and pants, right? Yeah. So, now we've been also having a deal. Our dog, um, it, something, um, he, he, um, it, it might be an abscess. So we're getting it looked at. We're getting it taken care of. But my wife stayed home with the dog to take care of him after we went to a fucking sh- the I don't, this vet. I don't know. Maybe she was from Germany, and that's not saying anything bad about German people. It, it's just she seemed like she was afraid of this little thirteen pound dog. <laughs> that's weird, man. I never. I mean, I mean, they were my dog Otto, but he, my dog's 130 yeah. pounds, and and he's a ger- full blood German Shepherd, and he isn't real friendly with strangers. So my vets were a little freaked out by him when I had to take him in, but uh, yeah, nonetheless, they got through it. Well, Hopper, you know, Hopper's a Dachshund Chihuahua mix, but he's he's also a senior dog. He's a senior citizen. He's old. He's crotchety. Leave him alone. Let him do his thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's kind of like uh, I've got a couple of those too, a couple but of old dogs. With the abscess on his eye, you know, he uh, uh, we don't they, they we were trying to figure out what it was. Was it maybe something like a tooth abscess? You know that you know something like that. But this vet, it was like any time she like she would t- she would like poke at him, and he would squeal because he's in pain, and she would like recoil like this dog's gonna bite me. I'm like, first of all, he's a senior dog; he's not gonna bite you. He's never bit anybody in his life. That's weird. You know. That's weird behavior for a vet to just poke at a dog like yeah. that. So uh, my wife found a new vet. We're going to take him to him Wednesday, a, a new vet that basically said the other vet was full of bullshit. Because um, she was like, well, I'll just give you the stuff. You can go home and take care of it. I'm like, if I was going to take care of it at home, I would have done that. I came to you to figure out what the fuck was going on. So she, But she, you know, she stayed home with the dog, so I went out to find a suit jacket and pants. So I go to the store I never go to. I go to Kohl's because I'm like Kohl's. I like Kohl's. <laughs> well, I'm like Kohl's. Kohl's will have a suit jacket, right? 
I don't go to Kohl's because they're a bit on the pricey side of things. And I'm like the Wal- I'm like a Walmart special kind of guy. Yeah, the thing that's cool that's cool about Kohl's is they give you that Kohl's cash, and they give you like a lot of it. And the, and the, and you go in there, and if you buy a bunch of shit, you get like a whole bunch of money knocked off of it. So it's really not as expensive as it seems. I don't think. Yeah, I bought like 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 I said, I bought the suit jacket and stuff, and they gave me like twenty bucks, like twenty Kohl's bucks or something like that, right? Yeah, and you can use that whenever. I think it frees up like two weeks from when you purchase it. It frees up sometime later after you buy it. But, that's like twenty three bucks in clothes. I mean, you can get a couple of t shirts. Right. So, um, so I go in there now. Like I said, I hate buying suits and, and dress pants. I haven't done it in twenty years. Uh, <laughs> I don't even own a suit now. Now, as we know, I'm a bigger guy. I'm losing weight, but I'm still a bigger guy. So I'm trying on suit jackets, and this was my method of of finding the suit jacket that I bought. This one doesn't fit. This one doesn't fit. This one doesn't fit. Hey, this one fits. I'm buying it. Yeah. That's how that's, I did. Well, that's how I am with anything, too. Well, <laughs> hey, is it fit? All right. Good enough. Then I go for the pants, and like I said, I'm down a few pant sizes, but I don't know what the measurement is, but apparently my waist size is not congruent to my leg size, so the pants are always, like, the leg is always too long, and I'm like, maybe I need to go to, like, Husky Boys, <laughs> because then the <laughs> pant leg would be right. You know, but I finally found a pair. I'm, I'm, I look good at. I, I now I did not go with the with the Donald Trump red power tie. I went with the blue power tie. <laughs> no maga for you. Huh? No maga. I went with the blue power tie. So I'm I'm excited for that. But the other good thing about Friday, and then another good thing about tax return season, is I I the wife let me pull the trigger. She let me pull the trigger. You have no idea how jealous I am, by the way. And. Uh, Oh, I about shit my pants when I saw the picture of what you got. I bought a Nintendo Switch, and Chief, oh my god. You, I know! You need to get one. Oh my god. I know! God. No, no, here's the reason why you need to get one, first and foremost, and it's, and it's the topic I really want to get into well, tonight. I haven't gotten my tax return yet, so we'll see. We'll, we'll see what's happening here. Here's, the, here's what, why you need to get it, and it's a topic I want to delve into in just a little bit. And that's Legend of Zelda The Breath of the Wild. Yeah, that one oh, and Mario my. Odyssey, I want more than anything. So I bought both those games. Because really, those are the only two games I really wanted right now. You know, you know, hopefully some more come out later. Like the Metroid games, I want Metroid on there, you know. So the cool thing about this, and I know other podcasts have probably talked to this to death, but I just got one, so I'm talking about it, is not only, I love it because not only you, you put, it, it's a, so the console itself is like a tablet, right? It's a tablet. Yeah. And you you hook the, the Joy Cons. They're called Joy Cons. Your controller things. You hook them on the side of the tablet, and you can play it. You know, kind of like an old PSP yeah. or DS. But then you could you could take those off, and you could put them in this little caddy and use it as like an actual controller. Um, but then you could take the tablet, and you could put it in its docking station, and it will project. It, when you put it in the docking station, it hooks into the HDMI cable, so it goes up on your TV. So you have like two ways to play. TV or handheld. So you're sitting there playing the game, and the space wife says, I want to watch this show. Okay, you just undock your tablet, and you can still play the game. And I, I and, and, and here, whole, dude, I'm going to tell you this. You were, you played Skyrim. You played yeah. Skyrim. How many hours? I played it a lot. I got obsessed many, with it. How many hours did you lose in Skyrim with that open world? Uh,. At least 72. I mean, not consecutive, but like over time, probably 72 or maybe over 100. I don't know, a long time. I was like, when I when I stopped playing, I was like, uh, I haven't played in a long time. Uh, I was like level 54, Vampire Lord, Head of the Dark Brotherhood. Um, I owned like five houses. I had like a bunch of shit. Prepare to lose even more of that with Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. When I say this game is huge, dude, I mean it is huge. So I'm I'm like between my bouts of uh, of of comas, I've been playing this like nonstop between my comas, and I am like maybe I have some weird dreams. <laughs> yeah. Um, like storyline wise, I'm probably like three quarters of the way through the game already. But as far as everything to do in the game, I have not even, like, I am, like, barely scratching the surface. This map is 
freaking huge. Like, it's it's everything you've ever wanted in a, in a Zelda game. Open world, you can go to every single freaking area that's ever been in a Zelda game. And just the... I mean, it's it. I'm, I'm flabbergasted because this game is so fucking good. It yeah, is so I, fucking I want one so bad, man. I, I couldn't even believe it. I was like, oh, man. <laughs> so I, well, I pulled the trigger. I was like, you know what? I want a fucking Switch. I want a fucking Switch. I'm going to buy a fucking Switch. My wife was like, go ahead. I go to GameStop, and the guy was like, well, I got a used one. I'm like, so it's cheaper than a new one? He's like, yeah. And it was pristine condition, no scratches on it, no defects on it, no, I've had no problems with it. So I got that. It was the red it's and blue one. It's crazy that people are already bringing them back and getting rid of them. Well, you know, maybe they decided they wanted uh, an Xbox One. The only, I, that's the only new console I don't have is the Xbox One because most of the games I, I want are crop, you know, they're on both PlayStation and, and Xbox. But Zelda. So I have been a Zelda fan my entire life. I have played every fucking Zelda game from the beginning. You've seen me play like you've seen me like beat the Zelda games. And yeah, that was one of the, that was uh what was the one you just did? You just did one. Zelda 2. Yeah. Which is hard as fuck. The good thing about this game and and I don't know like when um when we had Mike Matei on, he had he had done like 17 yeah, I think he went longer than that after that. I think he did more after that, didn't he? Wasn't it, yeah. Didn't it end up being over 20 hours? Of yeah, something like that. Something? Now, here's what's funny, and this is what... I, I love Mike to death. I, I love watching his stuff, but... I realize when he plays, he does... I don't know how much he immerses himself in the game, or he just kind of goes from point A to point B to point C. See, I don't know. I wonder if he has a private game other than the one he plays online. Like, the one right. he's doing online is just to demonstrate what's going on, and then maybe he's probably playing it privately and doing it more intricately. Right. I don't know. But, like, some of the stuff that I, I remember him complaining about, I never had an issue with. Like, he was like, I can, he was like, compl he, like, I remember when he was the first couple streams, he's like, I can never find arrows. I can never find arrows. And then I'm finding arrows everywhere. Is there like different levels? Can they, is it like some harder levels and stuff? Maybe he's playing it on hard. No, no, it's one level, but based it's it's based off of, um, you know, the monsters in different areas are or have more health. So based off of your weapons you have, how strong the weapon is, how strong your gear is, how many hearts you have, how much stamina you have, all play a factor into it. What I think is cool about it is it finally looks like I always wanted it to when it was on the NES. Right. It finally looks like a 3D fleshed out elf character in a full world with the monsters and stuff looking like they're like they did in the artwork for the game. Yeah, and and here's what's really awesome is, so, so for those who don't know about this game, uh, this game Breath of the Wild, when it starts, Link has been asleep for a hundred years after Ganon had um, what they call Calamity Ganon had shown up and basically decimated uh, parts of Hyrule and Hyrule Castle and things ah, like that. So it's a it's a continuity. It's it's a, it's like a continuous from all the other games. It continues on. It's not just a brand new thing on its own. No, so basically and and they've hinted at this in other games, but this one I think fully fleshes it out is really the only Zelda games that are that like like some Zelda games are direct sequels like Zelda and Zelda 2 The Adventure of Link are direct sequels. Yeah. Or um, uh, Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask are sequels. But the way they have this set, the way they say it is that every, I don't know, 100 years or something like that, Ganon keeps coming back. He's like this thing that just keeps coming back, and then every time he comes back, there is a princess and a hero that defeat him. And this Link and Zelda are just the latest in the line of the princess and the hero. Hmm. So, this game actually has bits from every single Zelda game, like, almost ever. 
There's parts from there's there's things from uh, Ocarina of Time. There's things from the first Zelda. There's things from um, Twilight Princess. They're all in there because like there's one point the like Zelda's talking like about the Master Sword. She's like whether it was Skyward or travel through time or battling the Twilight. You've always been with the hero. I'm like well so so she's talking about. Legend of Zelda, Sky, uh, Skyward Sword, Ocarina of Time, and Twilight Princess. So it all connects. Everything connects. Hmm. And there's, like, the Great Deco Tree is in the game from Ocarina of Time. There's there's the different races. Like, they even talk, uh, when you're at the Gerudos in the desert, they actually, the Queen of the Gerudo people mentioned that, at, that Ganon at one time in history took the form of a Gerudo. And it's t- and now she's going to get payback, which is once again Ocarina of Time, where he was a Gerudo. It's just it's so awesome how they took every Zelda game and kind of incorporated it into this one gigantic open world. Now I didn't play many past what what was on just the NES, the original right. Zelda, and and so uh, what are the like the what are the formats? Are they all uh, are they all the same format as as the original Zelda game, or is and this is the only one that's like a 3D world in the series, or is are they well, is there other ones that go that that change the format? Of? There are other ones that change the format. So, you you know the original Zelda, the the NES Zelda, the classic as we know is like the top down view. Yeah. So Zelda Two: The Adventure Link was a side scrolling platformer basically. And it had a level. See, I, I only remember the over the, the looking down one. The, the, yeah. the I own, that's the only one I remember ever playing was the original Zelda. I don't even remember the other games. Now that 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 style was the same on like the Super Nintendo with Link to the Past. That was top down. The Game Boy ones were top down. Uh, the Game Boy Advance ones, for the most part, were top down. Once you got in, once uh, that's what I think of when I think of Zelda is that that view. Yeah. Of the game. Now, once, you know, the Nintendo 64 came out and it went to 3D, then, yeah, Zelda made the, you know, Link made the jump to 3D with the, those Zelda games and, of course, on the GameCube, and it became more epic. But this is the first one that's more, like, extreme, open world. There is really, you, you there, it's not linear. There's no linear path. You don't have to do A, B. They, like, there's some things you want to do. They, like, there is a path you could take. But they let you choose how to get to that path. So mm-hmm. you could just spend like hours and not even get to, you know, the first big thing in the game because you're too busy doing all this other stuff. Yeah, that's that's similar to Skyrim in that you have missions, but you, yeah, you could ignore them for as long as you want. You can just run around killing shit if you want to for hours. Yeah, and it is, I'm like literally, it's huge and. I love the story. So, Ganon shows up a hundred years ago, and the Hyrule had actually become more technologically advanced, and they had unearthed these ancient technologies, like guardian robots and these things called the Divine Beasts, and these are huge mechanical uh, beast creatures that are piloted by a champion from one of the four races in Hyrule to combat Ganon, to help Link combat Ganon. And it's like there's, it's like a bird, an elephant, a camel, and, I, and it's either a gecko or a chameleon. And they're just huge, giant beasts. And Ganon ends up taking over the beasts. He ends up corrupting these beasts and killing the champions that were piloting them, the champions of Hyrule. And now their souls or their spirits are trapped inside these beasts. So Link is trying to, one, get the beasts back on their side, which that's the dungeons in the game, are these beasts. And then, you know, free the spirits of these former champions, and then you get, like, some special abilities, which really help out in the game when you're trying to traverse the land or fight monsters. They really help out. It's it's beautiful. Let me just one say of the that. Thi- one of the things I like that I, I was well, I watched Mike Matei play a lot of it and uh, and one of the things I like is uh, well there's one one of the questions I got is the, do the do the daytime and nighttime hours like it, 
how do they how often do they like how's the change on that? Is it in real time daytime hours? Or no, it's like, not. It's not real time. It's like uh, it, like in Skyrim, you got like uh, just all of a sudden it'll start getting lighter. Just <laughs> it's like it's like, yeah. it'll, like it goes day and night, and it, it counts days and time and everything. But the the light cycles are are sped up. Yeah, it does that too. It does that in the game too. The one thing that really sucks in the game is how much it rains in fucking Hyrule. <laughs> It fucking rains all the goddamn time in fucking Hyrule. It looks cool. I really like the lighting on it because one of the one of the things I that I saw Mike playing was that uh, when it was kind of uh, either dusk or or dawn. I, I couldn't tell, but it was uh, like just it just that that uh, kind of diffused light behind mountains, like over the, like the the fields of the, the weeds yeah. blowing and stuff. That just looks fucking amazing. <laughs> all, so that, cool. all that detail is crazy. Like, you could sit there, you could, like, stand on a ridge and just let time elapse and watch the sun, like, come up from behind, like, a mountain a mountain range. You know? Uh, they put so much detail into this game. Like, you can't, like... Like, you know most video games, oh, look, a snow level. I'll go to snow level, nothing's gonna harm me. In this game, if you don't go in the snow level with either... Um, cold resistant food to eat so you raise your body temperature or actual like cl- like arm clothing that is optimized for like the snow you'll freeze and die yeah that's that's new cuz you don't uh, like skyrim you can just go anywhere and you're not affected by the elements really yeah but, this one you're affected like even going up in a tower because they even put it like you go up in these towers um which um in the game that's how you get your maps of the areas that's how yeah. you uncover the area, is you go in these towers. And in some areas, because the towers are already on top of, like, a mountain or something, the higher you go up, the temperature drops as you go up this tower. So even elevation-wise... What about uh, water? You got a certain amount of breathing time underwater and, and yeah, stuff in the water? In the water, you have until your stamina bar runs out, and then you, you drown, and as long as you got heart, you'll go back to, like, the shoreline. And you can yeah. you can raise your stamina. There's ways to raise your stamina. Yeah, I would say it's uh, Skyrim's a good thing to compare it to from all it that is. I've seen about it. But uh, that's that's the one the one thing in Skyrim I know that the, one of the elements that does affect you is water. I know if you don't have the mask that you can breathe underwater, then you will drown if you stay under too long. So yeah, like I was playing it and I was at this on this like the Hylian Bridge, right? And I saw this giant dragon, like a Chinese dragon flying overhead, and apparently there's like three of them in the game, and I think I've seen two of them. Maybe I've seen all three. But there are these Chinese dragons, and then this blood moon rose. So you get the regular moon, but then every so often you get a blood moon, and that respawns all the enemies you've already killed. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Well, then I see this like red shooting star, and I'm like, Okay, I need to follow this motherfucker. You know, it's a red shooting star. I need to follow this. So I follow it, and it's a treasure chest, and it's, like, a special, like, treasure from, like, the crossover with, like, Xeno, Xenoblade or something like that, Xenoblade Chronicles. And it gave me this helmet that allows my swim speed to be, like, I can swim faster. Yeah, so that's cool. Can you get, like, um... Could you get magical items that like uh, protect you from shit like that? Because like I said, in Skyrim, they've got a, one of the wooden masks you can find will let you breathe underwater, so you never have to come up. Uh, there are things like like I found in like one of the shrines. I found like this rubber armor that reduces like uh, shock damage. Yeah. And you you know if you didn't get that chest in that in that shrine, you never would have known it was there. I would almost have to get a book on it. Like a cheat book, just to to make sure I got everything. I wouldn't use it all the time. Like with Resident Evil, I would buy the cheat book, and I wouldn't use it unless I really got stuck. Right. And I would just keep it there, and then I would look and say, "What the fuck do I have to do?" And I have to look it up. It's like the biggest thing in the game that I find myself having to do is cook, because you have to. That's how you get your hearts back is you eat food. So you all over Hyrule are like fish and you can kill animals and get like their meat to cook and you can find wheat and herbs and goat yeah. milk and butter and eggs and you can do all that in, the, in skyrim too you can like make different they have like cooking pots just set up in certain places and you find them and you can like mix stuff together and make yeah. different food and in this one like if you get like you can capture like frogs and lizards and stuff and if you mix those with like um like the uh enemy guts that you can pick up 
it creates elixirs. <laughs> it creates elixirs, so you can get like an elixir to like boost your speed or your durability. So yeah, you can uh, you can do similar shit in, in Skyrim. Yeah. Uh, they must have. I wonder how much of, of like the action, like how much the playability was was kind of based on Skyrim, or if they. Because it, it sounds really similar. Cause you can do all that shit. You can buy different. You can find different ingredients in the forest, like in Skyrim, different flowers and shit. And then if yeah. you find like a, if you find an alchemy station, you can put it all together into different shit that does different stuff. I'm telling you, dude. I you like, and the and here's what's really ingenious about this, is you're playing it, and the, the Nintendo knows when you know people are gonna put a lot of hours into this Zelda game. Add in the fact that. If somebody in your family wants to watch TV, you can still play by just unhooking the tablet from the docking station and continuing to play as a handheld. With and the tablet is really good picture and sound. They they basically they have they have contributed to America's obesity. <laughs> do you have a uh, like full internet? Is it like a does it work like a real tablet? Can you do full internet access on it? Uh, everything? I have not tried any of that yet. Um. I've been playing Zelda. Now yeah. the boy, I've been letting the boy play Mario. That's the one I want more than Zelda. That's I love Mario games. I always have. This one is I Mario Odyssey is really cool. Um, you know, it's kind of the same lines of any Mario game. You go to different kingdoms, you get certain, you know, you find moons or stars or whatever. Yeah, I love the 3D ones. Like Mario 64 was probably still one of my favorite games of all time. Now this one you can so this one's mechanic is you your hat is like sentient. It's a it's actually a uh, a creature from the cap like the cap kingdom or something like that, and he becomes your hat and you can throw him, and at certain enemies you throw the hat it will actually allow you to like possess the enemy. <laughs> That'd be cool. And, and you can use their powers and in the second level. There's a giant sleeping T-Rex. And if you throw the hat at the T-Rex, you can possess the T-Rex. <laughs> and you can just be a rampaging Tyrannosaurus throughout the that, you know, as long as you have it. The the thing of it is is it does, you know, like any Mario game, it seems really easy. Like three hits on the bosses and they're done. Right. And their patterns are real easy, which it, I guess it's kind of the staple of most modern Mario games is they're really easy. I mean, they're more family games. It's not yeah. like playing Skyrim where you're hacking a dragon's head off. <laughs> but but it's fun to it's fun to freaking have Mario you know bounce on top of people's heads and shit. Well, yeah, I mean, well, Mario's Mario, well, especially for people my age and and younger, is that's what we grew up on. That yeah. was like the first like the Nintendo Entertainment Center when that. With Super Mario Brothers, when you get that package, it was like that was the greatest thing in the world, man. I mean, I'd spend, I would spend all day with my cousin Derek, and we would play that like all day well, long. Well, we were, we were accustomed to you know a blipping screen that didn't look like Pac Man. Yeah, know, that's what we were used to was Atari before that, or uh, or you know ColecoVision or or things like that. We see Mario running, jumping, getting different powers. Yeah, well, I mean, as, as video games progressed, like I remember. When uh, me and my brother got uh, a 2600 one Christmas, and and uh, since that date, since that time, uh, and and watching video games, they just get more amazing. Like especially, like I say, somebody my age looks at what's out now, and I, I can't even fucking. It's like I'm in a different fucking. I'm like I'm in the future. Yeah. Because I remember a time before even VCRs, a cable or anything. I remember having three channels on a fucking tube TV with no remote, and you had to change the channel by hand. Like I remember that shit, and like it, seeing what video games are now, and like streaming entertainment and shit like that, it just blow. I'm so happy. <laughs> I just I look at all these miserable people, and I think, why are you not happy? Right. This is the greatest fucking time in history. Well, you think about what's it, wrong with you? We we get to play these games. Like I get to enjoy playing Breath of the Wild, and and actually living. I'm actually it, it like you're actually Link. You know, you finally get to be Link in this gigantic, elven, mythical world, right? Yeah, exactly. It's like, then, it's like it finally looks like I always imagined it would look in my head. And then we get to watch our favorite Twitch guys, Djibouti, 
create characters in Grand Theft Auto. Yeah, they're making TV shows out of Grand Theft Auto, which is brilliant. You know, it's it, video games have just expl- you know, they're they're just so much more. They're just so much more than we ever thought they would be. They're st- I mean, like I said, well, people were still calling them a fad, even up to Nintendo. When yes. Nintendo came up, people were still, oh, this is a fad. Kids are going to get sick of this. And it's like, no, they're no. not. This is going to get huge. Well, like, I remember, like, like the Atari 2600, it was pretty simple. You know, shoot everything on the screen. Or if you did get, like, those games like Raiders of the Lost Ark or something like that that was really intricate, you know, that had a lot of intricate parts. But then Nintendo comes along, and you get you open up the instruction booklet, and you read this story about a plumber who ends up in the Mushroom Kingdom and now has to save a princess, and you know when you're playing, that's your objective. You're going to save a princess. Of course, she's always in a, another fucking castle. But, <laughs> you know, or or Link, or or Metroid, where you're on an alien planet and you have to kill all the Metroids and Mother Brain. And nowadays, it's their movies. Nowadays, video, you know... Yeah. They're fucking cinematic movies that you could just... Yeah, you get to be the character. Like, that new Spider-Man game is coming out. You oh, get to be I Spider-Man. Wait. I can't wait. <laughs> you get to I be fucking wait. Spider-Man. That's insane. I, I, it's it's unbelievable. I, I just... It blows my mind how far uh, just graphics and the way the way they make video games and what they can do with shit now. It's it's mind-blowing. Well, the Arkham games, you got to be Batman. For like yeah, the first exactly. Time, be Batman. Now, if they and, and they're one. huge open world Gotham, like you, like especially the last one where you just had the whole fucking city. You can yeah. just patrol now, the whole city as Batman. That's amazing. And there's so many alcoves, and and you're they put so much stuff in from the comics, and you're just like I I rem- I've read about that. Now I get to <laughs> see it. You know, now if they can give us a Batman game like or a game like Arkham for like Superman or Flash. Or some or those other DC characters. Oh yeah, I would love to see solo games for all those characters. I would love to see a Flash game. I would love to see a Green Lantern game where you meet the Green Lantern Corps and you fly to different planets in space and do stuff, create, figure out how to do different light constructs. That would be awesome. I mean, it's weird that when you t- you know we're talking about the Spider-Man game and we're actually going to get this, you know, truly. Now they did, I guess, with with Spider-Man Two, which was a which was a great game. Um, but with this one, you know, you'll you'll get to swing all over New York. You'll get to do all yeah. this stuff, and it's kind of funny that the that the the superhero game that really did allow us to have that open world Marvel feel was Lego Marvel. Did you ever play Lego Marvel? I never I never played it. My nephew played it. He used to have, he played all the Lego games like Indiana Jones and. Lego Marvel was so awesome because it really was all of New York. You had all of New York, and you could go everywhere. And they had, they had the event and Stark Tower. They had the Baxter Building. They had Pym Labs. You know, Alchemex was there. Uh, Roxon Corporation. Everything was right there. The yeah. X, the the, the X Mansion. Everything was there, and it was truly open world. You can go wherever you wanted. It was. You know, I, I remember playing that and walking down the street, and there's there's Frank Castle, Lego Frank Castle's just standing on the street, <laughs> and I go up to him, and he's like, "I'm getting sick and tired of these people who can't drive right in New York City. Here, take my Punisher van and kill and, and destroy the people who can't drive right." So you're in a <laughs> Lego Punisher van, and you're driving around, and you're you're you have to destroy this reckless driving car. <laughs> and, I uh. I was just thinking, like, how, how games are today. It, it's so weird. Cause, like, what, what's cool about watching uh, uh, James and Mike, uh, well, just, just the James and Mike Mondays or whether they're doing uh, 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 old video game reviews, what's cool about those channels and the gaming channels on YouTube is that when I was a kid, when a new game would come out, I didn't know that sometimes game creators were lazy assholes that just made shitty games. I had no idea. I thought, yeah. well, maybe I'm, maybe something's wrong with me that I don't know how to play this right. Maybe it's something that's like, no, you come to find out. No, uh, James Roth will uh, clearly demonstrate this is just a shitty game. <laughs> this is a shitty game. There's nothing wrong with you. Uh, these guys were lazy and made a shit game. And it's like, that never even occurred to me when I was a kid that they would, that they would spend time and money to develop a shit game that didn't work. I and now I know better. 
I will tell you the moment that James connected with me, and I've been watching James since probably since he started on YouTube back what two thousand six. Yeah, was when he couldn't land the plane in Top Gun. <laughs> That's a funny one. <laughs> because I could never land the fucking plane, and it wasn't until he explained how to actually land the plane, I, I, I sat in my chair and I went back in time, like five-year-old spin, and I'm like, you motherfucker, it was right there on the screen how to land the damn plane. And you can never land the damn plane. <laughs> or, or Who Framed Roger Rabbit? I had Who Framed Roger Rabbit because I loved the movie. And I'm playing the game, I'm like, what does this have to do with Roger Rabbit? Why am I answering like riddles and shit? And can I call this hotline? Mom, can I call this line? Call it 20 years later, and it's a sex line. It's just freaking hilarious. <laughs> i uh, I got to type a quick message. Sorry, everybody. No, no, no. <laughs> Somebody, actually, I just got a, a message from an old friend of mine that you know, too, but I don't know if they're your friend. <laughs> uh, an old friend of mine uh, finally uh, mailed my Neil Adams, uh, Rick Grimes print to me. Ah, and, after all, it's in the mail. I'm supposed to get it in two and three days. No. So, uh, thank you. I'll say thank you because I appreciate it. I'm not better late, better late than never. I will not hold my breath. Well, we'll see. So unless it gets lost in the mail, it should be here in a couple of days. But I've been waiting for that for uh, how many years now? Quite a few years, man. Quite a few years. But like. I'm sitting here and I'm looking on my game on my on my desk here and I've got like Batman Returns for Super Nintendo which was a good beat 'em up. But watching how it evolved to Arkham. Watching how all these games just evolved, some better than others. Yeah, I mean that's exactly what I mean. I mean I'm watching from from NES from from my 2600 to NES to Super Nintendo to PlayStation to Xbox to to now to what we got and it's just fucking amazing. It's it's insane, and you know I've been gaming my entire life. You, my vault is full of video games, and I think everybody around our age has been. I mean, there's been no choice. Every kid at least has played some video games in their life, yeah. unless you're Amish and then you've been playing video games your whole life. And it doesn't matter if it was you know like like Super Mario or if you were more into like the sports type games. You still play Tetris. Games. Tetris was always one of my favorites. Even I, I like Tetris. action games. Tetris you know, is still one of my favorites. I'll sit and play that on my phone for hours. I, the only thing I hate about the phone Tetris is I hate using my finger for Tetris. I prefer like a controller, and yeah. I don't understand. Like I'll be I'll be scrolling my my tetrominoes down right, and all of a sudden it'll, I'll like push down and it'll say like I I held one of the pieces. I'm like. What do you mean I held one of the fucking pieces? I don't hold a piece for later. Put it back <laughs> in the fucking stack. I had to put place for it. You know? Yeah. I, I love Tetris. I remember that was like the game that came with the Game Boy when my parents bought me my Game Boy. Game Boy came with Tetris. And you would just lose hours playing that game. Yeah, I had it. I had it on Game Boy, too. Great. Now, oh, great. Here it comes. <laughs> my friend, uh, a buddy of mine that, that I went to high school with, and uh, later on uh, when he got his house, I helped him. When, we went to um, he wanted to get some cabinet games, like real arcade cabinet games, because he right. was building up, he was building a bar in his house. And there's a place here in Rockford that's a big warehouse just full of cabinet arcade games. You mm -hmm. can go there and buy them, pretty cheap. Like I think he paid 150 bucks for one of them and maybe like 200 for like really dirt cheap right. cabinet games that work. And we got uh, we got Double Dragon and uh, we were looking for Donkey. We really wanted a Donkey Kong really bad, but the guy oh. didn't have one that worked. But uh, we got Double Dragon. We ended up getting Double Dragon and a Tetris arcade version. No, oh, nice. And we would sit in his bar and just get loaded all night long and play Tetris matches against each other. And that was the some of the funnest times ever. So the ones I truly want, if if I had my my pick of cabinet games that I could have, I don't know where I'd put them in my goddamn house. I'd have to probably like re-renovate my front room from like the reading room into like the, the arcade room. I want. Oh, hey, you ever want them? I know where to get them. I got them dirt cheap. <laughs> so I want the ones I want. First, I want Bucky O'Hare. I want Bucky O'Hare because. You see that toy line's coming back, by the way. Oh, I can't wait. 
I can't fucking wait. And here's what I really don't. This now, this one I will have to disagree with uh, with with Mike on. Is he was like you know a lot of th- when he talked about Bucky O'Hare, which great NES game. He was like a lot of things emulated Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, but Bucky O'Hare was a comic book as well. Bucky O'Hare yeah. was a comic book. Like I think it was like more in the UK than it was here, but it was a comic book. Well, how many ripoff games did the almost the exact same uh, yeah. side scroller thing as the Turtles? I mean, so many. Well, this one was well. He's talking about like the characters in general, but so that that ran that got a TV series and it ran for like one season. So then, <coughs> excuse me, they created the arcade game, which was the finale to the cop to the cartoon series. So if you love the cartoon, you'd play the arcade game, and that was the series finale. That was the the end of the of Bucky O'Hare, and it was fantastic. So I want that, and it was a, it was one of those four player ones. So you could like get four players. I want the X Men arcade game, but I want I want the freaking like eight per, was it eight people or six was it eight or six? I don't um, think I think eight's too many. I think Dazzler, it had to be six. Dazzler, Nightcrawler, Colossus, Storm, Wolverine. Cyclops, so it's six. It was a six-person game. The dual, the dual screen. It was the double screen. I want that, and I want the Simpsons. I want the Simpsons arcade game. I, I barely, I barely remember. I remember we used to go when I was a kid. They had, there were two arcades in here in Rockford, and one of them was like up on uh, just a, a building into itself in town, and then the other one they had in the mall. So yeah, like. Yeah. Uh, me and my buddies would go to the mall. I, I would spend all night <laughs> in the arcade, spending all my money on fucking arcade games. And and I oh, you always hated that guy. Like the new like Mortal Kombat would come out, and you're just like, oh shit, I'm gonna play Mortal Kombat. This is gonna be fucking awesome. But you always had that one guy who somehow learned every fucking move in the game, and he would beat everybody. And you know arcade rules. Yeah, you, I, you play until you be, <laughs> you play until you get beat. So as soon as you lost to this motherfucker who somehow learned everything, you went back to the back of the line because the next kid got to play. Yeah, well, it was always a kid younger than me that would kick my ass. I'd be like a 16 year old in high school, and I'd have a 10 year old kicking the shit out of me. <laughs> Come on, kid. It's like, let's go play Galaga and we'll see who fucking wins, motherfucker. Yeah, right. Let's go play Centipede. I will. I will wipe the floor with you. Yeah, let, go go try Dig Dug. <laughs> I like Dig Dug. I love Dig Dug. <laughs> I like Cubert too. Cubert's one I used to like. Like Arcade Cubert was, was cool too. Um, I loved. Um, there was one I loved. I remember Chuck E. Cheese had it. It was a Jurassic Park game, but it was like the car, and you would sit down in the car, and it was like a rail shooter. But you were in the car, and the car would like tilt and move like back and forth and stuff. I loved that one. Nowadays, you go to Chuck E. Cheese. I haven't been in a couple of years because my kids kind of grew out of it. But I remember going to Chuck E. Cheese and it was nothing but like crap fucking like hit the spider or yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. You know? They're all like, like coin like, games and shit. Yeah, it was like ticket games. Like what happened to all the cool arcade games, man? Chuck E. Yeah. Cheese used to have all the shit. That's you know? weak. That's a, a lot of those things are in warehouses, man. A lot of them are cabinets, man. I went to this place. This guy had thousands of cabinets just in a huge warehouse. And we got the, the guy just said, look around, see what you want. So we got to walk through this fucking huge warehouse with like sit down like table like like the table games and he had tall cabinets he had the double cabinets he had like all, like everything you, that you've ever seen in your life was in this place the only thing he didn't have was a working donkey kong he didn't even had a donkey kong but like all the shit was tore out of the back of it and it was like all laying on the ground did he have like, polybius was, i don't if if anybody had it in this area it's probably in there but i i don't think so <laughs> I want to play choice. I want to play choice ten. I want one of those Nintendo arcade machines where the, you could put the Nintendo cartridges in the arcade machine and play them on the arcade. I want that. Excite bike. Oh god, I I got excite bike. It's. Mm. No, I mean, you know, one of my favorite one was uh, Spy Hunter. It used to be always one of my favorite games too. That would play the the theme from Peter Gunn. The, you, you, it was a set down one in the in the arcade. And, yeah, that was that was one of my favorites. I had that on the, my Commodore 64. I, I my uncle bootleg Spy Hunter for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, God, what I I like, what else did I love 
I, I mean, the arcade and me were synonymous. I, because, like, we had one in the mall. So, my, you know, your parents would, like, drop you off at the mall on a Saturday, just go to the arcade and play forever. Street Fighter, uh, Mortal Kombat, uh, some, you know, any, like, weird, like, beat em up games that were, that were there. You'd always play some beat em up games, like, maybe the Dungeons and Dragons games that they made into, like, beat em up games. Yeah. You know what game I always hated, though? I'll tell you the game that used to frustrate me, and I was convinced after playing it even twice that it was a scam for quarters, was Dragon Slayer. I oh, thought, this God, is the yeah. fucking piece of shit game. I was like, no, I don't, wanted to, don't, it looked so cool. I was like, oh, this looks so awesome. Look at animated shit. Don't let so Don awesome. Bluth hear it yet. Don't let Don, I don't want, Don Bluth may all of a sudden appear, and, and we're going to get fucked. <laughs> he might. Remember I have nothing the, against Don Bluth. I have a problem with whoever made that game. And Don the Bluth. actual play, well, he didn't Don do the playability. Bluth. He didn't create like the playability of it, and like the like he did the animation for it, which is beautiful, by the way. Every, that's why I wanted to play it. The Don Bluth. Bluth is the reason I wanted to play the game. The that playability game is... of the game is the reason I hate the fucking game. Did you ever watch the Nostalgia Critic uh, video on Dragon's Lair? Yeah, I saw where Don Bluth actually is in, in the video. Yeah. <laughs> See, Dragon's Lair was rough, but then Dragon's Lair Two Time Warp was even rougher. Yeah, I wouldn't even play it. I, would, I was so mad that I had wasted so much money trying to play Dragon Slayer. And back then, I think it was like a dollar a play even back yeah. then. And it was like, oh my god, I'd put a dollar in it and just lose a dollar in 20 seconds of the game had, over. That was a game where you had to spend so much money to learn every single screen. I gave up after losing so much money. I was like, you know what? I'm I'm not playing this anymore. I think this I think this is just a cartoon and it's fucking with me. <laughs> and a game that could not be ported properly for so fucking long. Like the NES version is a fucking side scroller. The um the Game Boy version, which I own, is it was like God, it was like some other game and they just Change the sprites to Dragon's Lair characters. <laughs> now, Space Ace was another one yeah. that that, <laughs> that was a I thought one. Space Ace was a little bit easier to control. I thought I thought yeah. it was a little bit better, but still sucky because those animated games was like it's like they were trying to do what we have now back then with animation, and it just didn't link up and didn't work. Well, you you're going through the arcade and you're hearing like the like the eight bit sound, like that arcade music. All of a sudden, you just hear Dragon's Lair. Yeah, like one of the yeah, one of the Dirk first ones with like Madari. actual voices and animation and yeah. cool looking graphics. And then you saw the princess and you were just in that skimpy black like negligee and you were just like <laughs> you know, you're a preview besant boy, you're like Yeah, I'm gonna save the princess, mother Yeah. <laughs> Fuck you, I'm gonna have save to get it. to that scene. <laughs> Gotta get to saving the princess and then you die on the first level and you're like Oh yeah, it just turned to bones. Fuck. Dirk just dies. Like, I can't save the fucking princess from the dragon, motherfucker. Yeah. But actually, the, the Saturday morning cartoons of Space Ace, I think there was a Dragon's Lair one, too. Those were... Yeah, there was a Dragon. It, it was like, I think Hanna-Barbera did it. I always thought, if they ever... See, Dragon's Lair is one of those I wish they would have made, like, either 20 years ago, or they could de-age him. Because somehow I just see Bruce Campbell as Dirk the Daring. <laughs> Oh man! By the way, uh, uh, Ash vs. Evil Dead is back on. Uh, yes, but yeah. it, we're a couple. I think we're a couple episodes in now, and it's uh, it's just as good as it was. <laughs> it's great. Ash's daughter shows up, right? Yeah, I have uh, I have pretty much uh, uh, given uh, The Walking Dead the blow off. Fuck off! It's off my DVR. I don't watch it uh, now. My Sunday nights are dominated by Bruce Campbell. Yes, and that's a good thing to be dominated by. My my TV's been like I said, dominated by Zelda and, and Link, uh, but. Uh, I've got new stuff to watch too. There's there's a, quite a bit of new stuff I gotta like they put on Netflix that I gotta watch. Um, oh yeah, there's some really good horror movies on Netflix. Some good foreign horror movies. I watched the last couple days. I've watched all the VHS movies, <laughs> which which I I thought the first one was pretty good. I like I just like anthology horror movies. Yeah. I like found footage horror movies. So you put those two together, found footage anthology horror movie. I'm gonna kind of dig it on some level anyway. Uh, the first two I thought were pretty good. Um, they, they kind of followed the same kind of thing. Uh, they find a stash of videotapes in a house, and it's all mystery and weird and dark, and then they play these tapes, and they're they're really creepy shit. Right. The, the third one, VHS Viral, 
it's similar in that there's anthology stories in it, but the whole uh, like Viral the core, video the, on yeah, the the core story of it, like the thing that surrounds the episodes, it didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. It just seemed ridiculous, and it was really there was these really grating, like you know when they do found footage where you like see static in the screen and there's like yeah. scenes like you get, you get like the blue like like just like a uh, blaring sound from the blue screen like, eh, and, like yeah. Like, shit like that. That was, like, dominant throughout the whole movie. Like, in between each scene, in between each uh, section, they had this weird video effect, and I hated it. <laughs> it was, was horrible. It like, I almost turned it off because it was so grating. Well, it's like, uh, VHS sounds like, like, having, like, an anthology based off VHSs makes sense. Once you go to viral, like, I hate the whole trend nowadays of horror movies with, like, the internet. Oh, there's a ghost in the internet, and he's going to kill you. Yeah. There's a Facebook I, ghost. I like old school. That's why my favorite of the Paranormal Activity movies is the third one. Because the third one is based around a VHS camcorder, which to me lends credibility and lets me get immersed in the story because you can't tamper with VHS tape. You can't edit VHS tape. So everything on it seemed 100% more real and in your face because this guy's just recording on VHS tapes and this freaky shit's going on. I so mean, I thought could. that was good. I mean, I, I, I took an, I mean, I took a class in high school and I was able to edit VHS tapes. It was just transferring from one to another, but... Well, yeah, I mean, well, you could do that, but I mean, that's editing and just that's yeah. editing in general. This is like uh, when you're doing found footage, this guy's just slapping a tape in a, in a VHS yeah. camcorder and, 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 and press tables play. are floating around the house. Yeah. <laughs> now, that was creepy to me. I thought that was the best one of the whole series because it's, it's set a recording on a VHS tape. Well, but, uh, uh, did you see the latest uh, uh, Cinema Snob episode? Uh, I don't think so. I haven't, I haven't, I haven't checked out his channel guess, in a couple guess days. Guess what it is. Hey, it's Death Wish 3, punk. Oh, yeah, I have to watch it now. Hey, punk. <laughs> punk. All right, dirt bag. <laughs> He's like, why did they make Death Wish 3? His wife's dead, his daughter's dead, he has no more family to avenge. Yeah, everybody keeps getting raped around Charles Bronson. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. my God. And you I know, can't wait for the Bruce Willis one. Oh, my God, that's going to be great. It's it's out now. I don't know how well it's doing, but yeah, I'm a big fan of uh, of uh, the, the original Death Wish and and Charles Bronson's just I I just love Charles Bronson. <laughs> that guy is the most stone faced, like just an old school tough guy ever. And I just I just love all those. I love movies. I like like Ten to Midnight and and uh, the mechanic. There's the mechanic. I think was him. Yeah, the mechanic. And uh, man, he's just and he there was a lot of like old westerns and shit too back in the day. But. Yeah. But yeah, Charles Charles Bronson is great. Yeah, so he he put up Death Wish three. Actually, he put up two this past week, and he did Death Wish Death Wish three. But then he also put on Best of Cinema Snob, and he put up Sleepaway Camp Part two. Oh, I did see that one on. I haven't watched it, but I saw it was on there. I yeah, didn't see the Death Wish one though. And the the Sleepaway Camp Part two one is good because it's the full review. So when he had it up originally because of YouTube, he had like the condensed version. Yeah. This one is the full version. And I and it's funnier when it's the full version. So and, and I'm sorry, Brad Jones's voice I fall asleep to that voice because it's just <laughs> it's so smooth. It is so <laughs> fucking smooth. He's you know? got a sense of humor that I just I just get it. like some of the just and it's like a it's real subtle. Like some of the things he says are just real subtle offhand remarks. And, but he says stuff's just so matter of fact sometimes that's just ridiculous. <laughs> it just it just kills me. I love it when he's watching. I watched the one he was uh, he did a Medea, a boo a Medea Halloween or whatever. Yeah. And he's sitting there and it, it, they like the show like the movie does a joke. It pans to him. He's just sitting. He go, he just goes, I don't think I'm the one this movie was intended for. And that just <laughs> makes me like crack up. That just makes me die laughing. I just like when he's like, okay, movie. You <laughs> know, like when he talks to the movie, it makes me laugh. I love it when he's just like, oh my god, what's this person gonna do now? You know, he, or he, he makes the it's not. There's jokes in it or something. It's the buttercreamers are maybe the the buttercreamer episodes are, are oh, really funny. Buttercreamer ones are great. 
I, the kid and I, goes to Chicago to become a gang member. <laughs> oh, I, oh no, I love it in in Boo Medea Halloween. The moment he shows Medea, instead of Medea talking, it's Fat Grandma, and he's just like, he's just like, <laughs> wait a minute, when did black, when did Fat Grandma become black? <laughs> oh man, oh, I see that guy. I see Linkara like argue. I gotta start watching Linkara more because he does comic book reviews, and I don't even really watch him that much, but. Uh, uh, I, I love wa- watching Linkar on Twitter because he's he's very uh, sarcastically yeah. <laughs> shitty to some people that write stupid shit to him. It's funny because I think Linkara, like, he's one of those that because of his living situation is not he's not a single issue guy. He buys the trade he buys more trades because just you know he doesn't have the space for single issues. Yeah. Um, the thing of it, I've, I've, I've watched a few of his stuff. I rarely watch it because I'm so opinionated at times, or I just don't care. You know, I like comic books for the way they are. I don't... Well, well I mean, we do reviews, too. It's yeah. probably probably not wise to watch. Well, we do DC reviews. We do other comic book reviews. We do a full comic book episode sometimes when Cool Beer comes on. So, I mean, I don't think it's a good idea for people that read comics and review comics to listen to other people's reviews and have their opinion tainted by that review. And I, I, think, I would rather read it cold and make up my own mind. And I've kind of learned that with Twitter is doing the reviews is that I can I have to stop getting into discussions about DC books when I'm reviewing them. Like somebody yeah. had put up something about the Terrifics uh, the other week about it basically being a Fantastic Four rip off, rip off which. Yes, I can see that. I can. Yeah, see that's that. it's definitely their DC's kind of answer to Fantastic. Since there is no yeah. Fantastic Four, I mean, right and now. this person was like, they're they're they are actually you know promoting it as a Fantastic Four ripoff, and I'm just like looking at my emails from DC, and I'm like, they never said this anywhere in the emails, and he's like, well, it's right here on this website. I'm like. Okay, dude. What? A random website. <laughs> and then it's always that hashtag. Well, he's right to a degree, but it was great, right. though. No, it was, right. it was a really great good. book, though. Yeah. What's the problem? I don't and care. I, I you know what that. else is a ripoff? Uh, uh, Hyperion is a ripoff of Superman. Yeah. So I mean, let's really? if we're gonna if we're gonna talk shops. Uh, really, Squadron Supreme is is the Justice League for DC well, or for uh, Marvel. Yes, all these new DC books are coming out with you know damage. It damage is freaking the Hulk. Silencer is the Punisher. Sideways is um, I, I'm not sure, but the Terrifics are Fantastic Nightcrawler. Four. Nightcrawler. Yeah, Nightcrawler basically. The Terrifics are Fantastic Four, and uh, Brimstone. It looks like it's going to be kind of like Ghost Rider. But yeah. this I'm is nothing. It. This is nothing new in comics. Like I said, Squadron Supreme is the Marvel's answer to the Justice League. So why can't DC have their answer to the Fantastic Four? Yeah. I don't see any problem with that. They don't mention anything specifically Fantastic Four. It's its own book. And the Terrifics was really fucking good. If you're not reading that, you're missing out. That's just your problem, buddy. And I, I'm i going to say this. I am I'm, I'm really hate the ha- this hashtag that's on Twitter called Do You Even Comic Book? I, I don't even pay attention to it. I, I really <laughs> am getting mad at that because it's like... I'm like... If you scroll, what is that, questioning my integrity? Go fuck yourself. I got 30-odd 30, 30 years, more than a 30, probably 37 years on. Yeah, but it's like everybody who wants to talk comics on Twitter nowadays is using that hashtag, do you even comic book? And I'm like, motherfucker, you can look at my collection and know I fucking comic book, okay? Well, I mean, here's the thing is I've forgotten more about storylines and, and issue numbers and arcs and artwork and artists and writers. I've forgotten more than most of these these guys that I see on Twitter uh, proclaiming to be great reviewers have ever even known. So, <laughs> I mean, I, I've probably forgotten more than they've ever known about comic books. So, I mean, don't don't throw that at me. I, I wouldn't do that to somebody. I wouldn't put that out there like, I'm the comic book expert. I wouldn't, like, do that. But, I mean, if you're going to fucking start calling people out, then, yeah, I'm going to step up and say, listen, motherfucker, yeah. you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. I've been reading comic books for 37 years. Suck my dick. That's why I've been staying off of Twitter. I don't post a lot. I don't tweet a lot anymore. I used to tweet a lot. Nowadays, it's like I'll put up a poll. I'll put up the show. I'll yeah. interact. There's with a lot of dumb stuff. shit going on in the comic book community right now. I mean, I've still got my like my people that I've got a core group of people that I speak to about comic books on Twitter, and that's 
most of them are the same core group from seven years ago when I started Twitter that I met. Guys uh, like Aaron Myers and Cool Beer and and Adrian Hunter and uh, and uh, uh, Doctor Spidey and and a lot of those guys uh, from the Spider Clan that we all had the hashtag Spider Clan back in the day. I still talk to that main core group of guys because they're all guys around my age, roughly, or around our age, roughly, and they've all been reading comics a really long time, and they all know their shit, and nobody has this fucking uppity high attitude like, I know more about comics than you do. Like, nobody does that. I mean, that's basically, if you got to do that, then you don't know shit, and you're covering for something. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't appreciate it. And there's just so much, there's so much fighting going on in the comic book community and there's all this, you know, uh, people like boycotting different books. I, I don't care. This, this, this is my opinion on comic books. I read the comic books I like. I read the, I follow the creators that I like from book to book and I read that and, uh, and, and I don't let uh, opinions cloud other, I don't let Twitter cloud my judgment of what I think about art and story in a comic book. I read the books and I decide whether I like them or not myself. And, uh, I don't, I don't like to, I, I, I don't read a lot of reviews and stuff. Like I said, I don't go to like newsarama a whole hell of a lot. Unless it, maybe if it's about movies, like comic book movies or something, I don't read specific articles written about current comic books by people on the different websites. I just don't do it. One, I don't want them ruined. And I, I, I would rather make up my own mind and have my own opinion than have, Somebody else's words in my head while I'm trying to read it. Right. Complete. Yeah. With you, 100% on that, man. 100%. I gotta go get my books anyway. I'm I'm behind. I gotta get. Oh, books. I am too. I got. Oh, I'm not behind on DC. I'm behind on Marvel a lot. Yeah. I got yeah. a lot of Marvel stuff. I gotta go pick up. Yeah. Same here. So, I want to thank you all for joining us tonight and and going down a little bit of video game and arcade history memories with us. Just uh, because I've been playing so much. Zelda between my, you know, blatant comas. Yeah, that brought up a lot of memories, man, because there's stuff I, I was just sitting here like, oh, wait, I remember, I remember this. And, like, Space Ace had popped into my head in 20 years, probably. Another game that could not be ported well for so many years. But, yeah, I mean, I love talking video games. I love talking about old arcade cabinets. You know, that's that's my... I love doing that. And I hope... um you know, to bring some of my classic, you know, my NES or SNES classic down to, excuse me, to uh, Chicago so we can play a little bit while we're in our hotel room. We're, we that. have so much stuff to do. Uh, we're going to have a blast, and we're probably not going to get to half of it, but we're just going to have a blast and go with the flow and have fun and meet all the cool people. And Sunday's comic by a day, buddy. We're going, we're going digging into some stacks. Oh, definitely. So C2E2 coming up in just a few short weeks. We are going to be there. Uh, if I do get this new job, I'm going to ask them if I can start after my scheduled vacation. That way I can still go to C2E2. Uh, but so much stuff going on. We'll be there Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, all three days of the con. Uh, Friday and Saturday, we'll be milling around, getting interviews and things for the YouTube channel. Sunday, like Chief said, we're gonna be, our, our heads are going to be in long boxes. We're going to get those last day deals. So if any of you want to uh, find us on Sunday, I would go to the comic uh, selling area of the floor, and uh, and uh, we we can help you out with some recommendations. Come find us. We'll we'll look through boxes with you. Exactly. Uh, we have also this past week we uh, got um, uh, emailed, and on Saturday night of the con, we will be at the premiere of Toxic Avenger the musical. Yeah, with, with Lloyd Kaufman is going to be there in Chicago with us. So we are actually going to get to be with Uncle Lloydy. We're going to try to get uh, him candid on an interview. He'll be doing a and a First hopefully... time in person. We've met him. We've talked to him twice on this show. This will be the first time we met him in person. So we're going to – all three of us will be in a room together. Yeah, it's going to be – it's going to – hopefully that room doesn't explode. Um, <laughs> but we're, we're – once again, if you're going to be there at C2E2, we want to know. Let us know. Look for us while we're there. Uh, we'll have uh, our cameras rolling, our phones rolling, our recorders rolling. So come on over, say hi. Um, Lloyd is the coolest, though, isn't he? He's like oh, the coolest dude in the world. I can't. Uh, he just anytime you call him, he's like, "Yeah, I'll be on your show." He just shows up. <laughs> it's yeah. unbelievable. Uh, now, due to my illness, I was not able to get um, Force Four out last week. 
but I will uh, be working on that this week to get it out for the upcoming weekend. So you'll have Force Four, and uh, we'll be getting back to doing some more movie review, uh, movie commentary. Just I wanted to get over this illness, so I'm not coughing every five seconds. Um, but we're gonna be getting that taken care of. Force Four coming this week. I will get it done. It'll be out this week. Oh, it's a good one. I think it's gonna be a good one. <laughs> so good. So we're gonna get that one out. Uh, thank you all for subscribing. If you're on subscribing to us on Podbean, every day I get emails saying we got a new follower on Podbean. So we want to thank all the new followers on Podbean that are following the show. Got thank some new likes know. on the Facebook this uh, last week too. I think a couple couple new likes. Got some new likes on the so. Facebook. Building and growing and getting bigger. That's what we want to do. Yeah, C three two is going to be a blast. You'll be getting tons of coverage of that. Um, uh, it's going to be fun. We'll hopefully get some. There's some major interviews we might be able to get. So uh, stay tuned for that. That's going to be cool. And then, uh, we're going to have so much fun. And it's going to be a couple. You'll get a, a couple of weeks uh, in the future. You're going to be getting a couple of shows of C two E two content. Exactly. Heavy. And that's all on the road to episode two hundred of the Nerd Rage Renegades that will happen later on this year. I think. When I Hopefully did, Cool Bear will be here for that. When I did the math and was looking at the dates, it looks like around the beginning of August of 2018 will be episode 200. I know that's like, wait a minute, August, that's still such a long ways away. But as we know, we're already in March. Yeah, and it, and it goes faster than you think. It goes so much faster than you think, and we were talking... We were talking about it this past week. It doesn't even feel like we, we were, were anywhere close to 200 episodes. Yeah, it doesn't seem like it. Well, I mean, like what well, we said, it's like this isn't like a job. Like the old the old podcast was a job. <laughs> job. This yeah. is just what we do. It was a job that Chief and I were like, you know what, we quit. Uh, oh, I think uh, I think uh, Cool Beer. Uh, he sent me something on Twitter, and I think he's already penciled in uh, episode 200 in his calendar. I don't know if he knows when the date is, but uh, I believe Cool Beer will be joining us for the 200th episode. And then just a short week after that, we'll be ep- hitting our anniversary. Our Four-year anniversary on the Nerd Rage Renegades. Yeah, that's that again seems unbelievable. It just doesn't seem like it's been that long. It doesn't. It seems like only yesterday we were angry and on like talking to each other, and like let's make our own damn show. Yeah, and uh, it, it really word of advice for anybody who wants to start a podcast: uh, the first step is just doing it. Just yep. do it. We never thought we'd ever do it, and uh, here we are, five years, two podcasts later. And still cranking it out. So, <coughs> couldn't spend a better Monday night than seeing this beautiful face in front of me. That's right. Look at that. These you can't see them. I get to see them. That's only yeah, for you. Me. You guys uh, have no idea how how uh, looking forward to uh, getting to Chicago this year. This is going to be the greatest thing in the world. I'm I'm so excited for you to get here. I can't wait. I'm going to make you my special uh, Masta Cholioli. Yes, and, oh uh, my god, this thing looks so... Did you post that anywhere? Because, god, it looks so good. No, you want... I, could, I put it in the messenger. That's all I, I, I know you put it in the messenger. You. you need to post that, like, everywhere, because that's just, like... That's, like, ambrosia. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm, I'm a good cook, man. I'm good. That's one thing most people don't know about me. Uh, I can cook the hell out of some food. So we, we're going to stock our hotel room up with some good food that we'll just microwave and eat all day long. Oh, uh, yeah. Bring, we'll get some like some tea. Some we'll get jugs of like raspberry tea and shit for me because I'm on like this raspberry tea kick. Oh yeah, we're gonna load up and we're gonna bring uh we're gonna bring everything with us. We're gonna try to save some some dinero for the uh, for the comic book sale on Sunday. Yeah, yeah. Don't need that. Don't need to get that like fifteen dollar slice of pizza from oh, the like, no. con no. floor. Well, we got that tram too running back and forth to the hotel for free all day. So when we get hungry, we just go out, go back to the hotel, eat a little bit, come back. It's going to yep. be great. We don't have that two-hour drive in the dark home every night. We just go back to our room, kick the shoes off, record some podcast shit, maybe do a movie commentary, watch some TV. It's going right. to be fucking awesome. Cuddle. Yeah, yeah snuggle up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll bring Otto. We'll sneak him in the room with us and just yeah. lay between us. We'll lay on him. Spooning, you know, do it all. <laughs> but thank you all for joining us. We're going to be uh, kicking off the uh, review portion of the show here in just a minute, but if you don't stick around for the reviews... Once again, thank you all. We're going to be, you can find us every single week on the Twitter at Nerd Rage Renegades and Space Chief 75. Of course, Facebook.com backslash NR Truth Radio. Stardust app, Nerd Rage Renegades. I'll be, I'm trying to get some more stuff on there. I've been, like I said, illness. They're probably wondering where the hell I am. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that's, a, it's understandable. You were really sick, though. 
I know you're really sick when I can't find you because uh, you're always on. You always answer my messages, and when I can't find you, then I know something's up. Yeah, like I said, I was in dreamland. Uh, YouTube.com, Nerd Rage Renegades on the YouTube. Go check out our stuff there. Once again, we're sorry we can't put the movies in the damn videos. Yeah. We, we don't want to get copyrighted. <laughs> Just take the 20 seconds and do it, asshole. What's the problem? <laughs> You're free not to watch it, too, all right? It's free. Crystal's going to tell you all the platforms we're on every single week. The Nerd Rage Renegades are on the air every Wednesday on Podbeam, Stitcher, Player FM, iTunes, Google Play, and every Thursday on GamingRebellion.com, Filling the Void Podcast Network, and now iHeartRadio. And now she's going to hit that spoiler alert, because we're going to talk some DC Comics. Spoiler alert, spoiler alert, the Renegades are about to spoil this week's DC Comics. Alright, so DC Comics this week. I read one because, like I, like I said, the whole episode I'm sick, uh, but it was a good one, and that was Batman. Yeah, this this story is uh, like I I I I'm it's not like a broken record how much I love Tom King's work, but I mean, it just gets better. I mean, his arcs just keep getting better. I mean, this is something different. I, it's different and fresh and new for Batman. This whole him being with Catwoman as his partner thing is. Is uh, something that I mean they partnered up before, but I mean now they're like like pretty much betrothed. They are, they they, like, they, they live actually, together. They actually sound like a married couple in this issue. Yeah, it's I I love the I love the scene with uh, when they're talking about who they're going to invite to the wedding. It's like oh I know Ivy because <laughs> everybody's <Yeah>. Ivy. <laughs> and Catwoman's just making fun of it. It's like there's this really grave thing. Like Batman's like she's taking over everybody, but Catwoman's just making light of it. She's like. Well, you're you know my maid of honor is going to be Ivy, and but you know your your best man's going to be Ivy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that. Uh, there, well, I'm looking at it right now. That when uh, Ivy's basically controlled every person on the planet except for Selena and Bruce, and because uh, they have they take they took some kind of cure in the nick of time that saved them from this takeover. And uh, in this issue, they kind of they figure out it's, that she's putting something in all the food. Like, everything yeah. that's that that is plant that has plant matter in it has this chemical agent that can help control minds and she's taken over the entire justice league so she's basically got superman in the air following them as they're driving down the road everywhere they go every person they encounter is poison ivy and she can see and talk to them through every person they meet which i think it's great that uh, in this scene she says isn't it sweet that she lets us out and then Superman's flying right over the Batmobile, and she yells out, I said, it's sweet that you let us out. <laughs> she, like, yelled it out to she, Superman. The one thing that was interesting in this issue is Catwoman's reflexes. She took out all three flashes. Yeah, that that was uh, that's pretty intense, too. But then, uh, don't they make mention somewhere that it's not really them? That's not, that's, this is Ivy using yeah, their it's powers. Ivy controlling it's, them. So they're not, they don't have the instincts to avoid a Catwoman kick. Yeah. It's it's the same where, you know, he, Batman says that Clark would know when to listen and when not to listen. Yeah, that's, that's yeah, that's how he he does a whistle and takes takes Superman out of the sky with a whistle because and, she's listening so close and then he does a shrieking whistle and it knocks him right out of the sky. And the thing of it is is Ivy has a whole dialogue with Catwoman where Ivy's basically she's trying to justify why she did everything. And it's not coming from a place of malice. No, not really. But I, I mean, but it, it's it's insane. The plan is insane. And even Catwoman's like, you're not you're not the Pam I know. Yeah. You're not her. You're not my friend. That would do this. And she does. And, and really, yeah, she doesn't know how to control the powers of the Justice League, as we see in this issue. Yeah. Uh, well, she she kill, she basically kills Bruce. She kills Bruce with Superman. And then revives him, but uh, he he pisses her off so bad that uh, Superman Clark just hauls off with a full on punch <laughs> and like pretty much crushes Bruce's skull. And uh, but she uh, she gets every like like the best uh, neurosurgeons in the world come and fix Bruce and and revive him, but. Uh, she does. She literally, Batman dies in this issue and is brought back to life. Yeah, <laughs> all in the span of a panel. Yeah, uh, you just see his. I'm looking at the, the panel right now. Just dead Bruce's head with half his mask blasted off. Yeah, from Superman. 
So yeah, Tom King it just gets better and better. It gets it, the the issues get better and better. Like I said, it seems like it seems like to me the Snyder run was what the family looking in at, looking at Bruce. It was like how the family saw Bruce, like the Bat family and the people closest to him. This um, Tom King's Batman almost feels like this is how Bruce sees himself. This is the inside of Bruce's head. Yeah. This is we're we're inside of Bruce's head looking out at his world now, rather than being the Bat family looking at Bruce from the outside. And as we and, said, like in this issue, <clears throat> Ivy says that there's rot in the green, and that's why she was doing all this. Is there's rot in the green, which this whole thing since the last issue when he started this, we've both kind of been in agreement that there there has to be an appearance by Swamp Thing at some point. Yeah, well, I think it. I think with Tom King's Swamp Thing Winter Special being just a mega hit out of the park, being so awesome, uh, we know he can write Swamp Thing. Yeah. So I, I think this has got to have something to do with Swamp Thing. I think that there maybe there is, maybe there is no humanly a human cure for this, but the Swamp Thing literally is the green. Yeah. So he could reverse this, I think, with some sort of chemical from his body could re- could reverse this control. And that's the thing, like, Ivy thinks she she controls the green. Yeah, but she no, Swamp has. Thing is the green. She doesn't control Swamp Thing. No, Swamp Thing is the green. And, yeah, so it's going to be really interesting, but such a good issue, great artwork. It's it's another oh, yeah. great bad issue. Just a mind blower. And so, like, like Capullo's work, I love Capullo's work. Um, I love his kind of really detailed, kind of scratchy kind of looking style that he does. This is just a different style. Yeah, but this style is just so clean and and just uh, beautifully colored and like there's not this this whole issue takes place in the daylight. Most of Capullo stuff, all the Batman stuff is is mostly unless it's a scene of Bruce going to or from uh you know Wayne Enterprises or something like that. A lot of the Batman books Snyder did were dark, they were moody. A lot of the this whole issue takes place out in the bright sunlight and it's just beautiful. Like all the green in it, the blue sky, the way Superman's drawn, the way Superman looks uh, flying way up in the sky over the battle. It just looks great. Definitely. Now, Chief, you need to take me down a trip to our favorite anthropomorphic uh, pink uh, mountain lion. <laughs> you know what? I, I, as much as I think this is weird, I'm getting hooked on it now. Because now it's hooked me in. And I, 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 I think I, I, you know, I still think it's weird. But I may have judged it too soon because I actually kind of dig it. <laughs> I'm starting to like this book. Uh, it's a good story. I just think it's weird that there's a big pink mountain lion as the main hero. Yeah. Uh, it's it's a really good story. But and the most disturbing part is Huckleberry Hound and um, and Snagglepuss go on a, a talk show and neither one of them have pants on. <laughs> <laughs> they have human legs. Business uh, sport coats and ties and vests and zero pants, which is uh, really strange. But uh, it kind of takes the there's a, the beginning parts. This uh, they're on TV doing it. Uh, uh, Huckleberry Hound and Snagglepuss are on a TV show doing a TV interview. Um, the uh, Huckle, uh, well, the uh, Snagglepuss is, is a playwright and he's got this play going on, and he hires this guy. And Peter Potamus being his stage manager, director, whatever, he hires this guy that he thinks is going to be a good actor, and I can't remember if it's supposed to be Gary Cooper or not that he actually hires, but the guy is, like, a terrible actor. Snagglepuss hired him just on raw talent, thinking he could handle this thing, but he can't. Apparently, he really sucks as an actor. Peter Potamus wants to fire him. So Snagglepuss, but Snagglepuss is, like, a fucking great guy, though. I mean, like, like he's, like, the nicest dude in the whole world. Uh, the guy... Rather than fire the guy flat out, he brings the guy in and says, you know what, uh, plays are for actors, and you want to be a star, so I'm going to set you up with a movie deal. And, like, sets him up with some, like, instead of, like, just flat firing the guy and making an enemy, he's like, you know what, you need to be a movie star. So he gets the guy in a, like, a role in movies or something. So, like, the Snaggle was, like, the, the most benevolent, nice dude in the world in this, and he's just getting shit on by the government. Because they're going to drag him in for the, the being a communist and shit and the McCarthy, interrogate him. The McCarthy trials. Yeah, and then it also this one also involves oddly enough Joe DiMaggio and Marilyn Monroe. Oh man, <laughs> which they play into it and uh, 
is is Marilyn Don, Monroe. Is Don Rickles uh, Squidly Diddly in there? Uh, I think Squidly Diddly. You just get a brief glimpse of him working the uh, the ropes backstage, like on the like the curtain ropes. Uh-huh. Uh huh. But uh, Snagglepuss has to stand in because Marilyn Monroe's been running around on Joe DiMaggio with another guy, uh, another playwright, and Joe DiMaggio's all pissed and is gonna beat up whoever she's with. And so she gets Snagglepuss to come in and act like he's the playwright she's been running around with. And because he's gay, Joe DiMaggio's like, oh, well, that's okay. And like, it like simmers down the situation. And uh, so then uh, they find uh, uh, Snagglepuss takes Huckleberry Hound to, like, the, the first gay bar in New York City. And then uh, they go visit an old man in the hospital. This is this grouchy old bastard. And uh, I think at the end of this is where... Oh, Huckleberry Pound finds finds love with a cop. Aww. And uh was it Andrews? Uh it was not Andrews. It was a I think it was like a giraffe guy. I mean, <laughs> oh, it was Bayo. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, exactly. Bayo. But uh it it's actually a I I'm I'm t- I'm intrigued by it. I was not expecting to be intrigued by this. But I think at the end of this is where they, they're going to drag him into the uh, House of un- Un-American Activities or whatever. But uh, the, at the end of it, the old man, I, don't, I can't tell if the old man died or if he's just asleep in his room. And then you got Marilyn and Joe DiMaggio together at last. And then it winds up at the end uh, at the end of the interview on the TV. Uh, and some of the panels are in black and white, like an old black and white TV show. Apparently they're on the the, uh, the Mo Franklin show instead of the Joe Franklin show. <laughs> and... Uh, but then you have uh, it's it's pretty good. I'm 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 liking it now. I probably wouldn't buy this like with my own money if I was going out and looking for books to buy. I would look at the Snagglepuss and think, you know, that doesn't look like Snagglepuss. I have no interest in that book. That's not you know, that's not really something. Whether or not whatever the subject matter was, if I just saw Snagglepuss on a comic book, that's not something I would buy. I'm more a Punisher guy. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I mean. Uh, the fact that I'm getting the review copies, I'm I'm starting to get into it, man. <laughs> I'm starting. I can't wait for the next issue of Snagglepuss. Now I'm starting to get it's into it. It's so interesting, and it's just like you said. Like the weird thing is, is it's a fucking giant pink mountain lion, a giant blue fucking dog. But the thing that's maybe maybe brilliant about it is the fact that once you start reading the story, you start to forget that that's a giant pink mountain lion yeah. and a blue dog. It, they become characters in the story just like anybody else, and yeah. it's not it does not this stark contrast anymore. After this first issue was weird. Uh, uh, second issue, uh, the, I, the, I, the weirdest thing about the second issue was was Squidly Diddley's face. That's like yeah, the weirdest that, thing in the second issue. Bizarre. And and I was still getting used to the fact like this is so weird that these animal characters are interacting with actual characters from history in the McCarthy era of the United and it's just, it was so weird. But now the intrigue with the House of on Un American Activities and all that shit's kicked up. It's it's got my interest now, and now I'm I'm addicted to it. Now I have to read issue four when it comes out. It's not just oh I got to read this for review. No, I want to read it whether I review it or not. Now I have to read it. So now I'm hooked on it. But then we get we get the second uh, installment of Sasquatch Detective as well as the backup to this. Okay. And. Uh, it's it's basically the I guess they're do because they don't have many pages to do a whole lot with this. Um, it's it's kind of like um, in the same kind of vein as like I kind of relate it to like how they do like fifteen minute shorts like Cartoon Network like right. fifteen minute condensed story. Um, this one and this one, uh, uh, Stasswatch Detective and her partner are in the police warehouse of unsolved crimes, and at the beginning of it, she makes a bet with her partner that she can solve. Uh, the guy said, you'll never solve one of these. I said, I bet you can't solve one box by the end of the year. And she makes the bet that she can solve it by lunch. And because of her heightened senses being a Sasquatch, she finds an old cold case and actually sniffs out a, a corpse from a, an unknown grave and actually digs up a body and solves a crime. <laughs> like And actually drags the coffin with the body into her office in the police station. And, uh, and she solves... She solves like a twenty-year-old crime just uh, uh, with her nose and her instincts as a as a Sasquatch, which is, it's kind of cool. I, I would love to see this get like a regular continuity arc, like something, even if it was a comedy book, because I don't think 
they're utilizing the character to its full potential with these little little short stories. But I like I would like to see a long run of like a maybe a mini series to start out and maybe do a, a long running arc that actually does something. But these are like individual just condensed little stories. Right. Um, she does uh, uh, befoul the uh, police station bathroom <laughs> <laughs> and, and has to crawl in. The end of the book is she has to actually crawl into the ceiling so the other female cops don't know that she uh, basically bombed out the bathroom. <laughs> and then uh, uh, one of the uh, female cops passes out from it. It's so horrendous. And uh, the hazmat guys show up and are taking her out unconscious. <laughs> so, uh, hey, then she says, hey, what happened to Helen? Like she has no idea that she's the reason that this happened. But uh, yeah, it, uh, I think uh, I was a little disappointed in the first uh, issue, uh, first part of uh, Detective Sasquatch. I think if they gave it more, like the character's cool, and I like the artwork. Like the the, the it's a cool concept. It's a cool looking character. It's uh, got cool artwork. I just think it needs to be longer, and I think it needs to have some kind of point to it. Mm-hmm. It's not just be like a short story. Right. But uh, all in all, yeah, I'm I'm, I'm fucking. One, one, I'm digging Snagglepuss now. I, I didn't think I'd like it. I was really thinking the first issue or the the first couple issues were really weird. But now by the third one, now that we're starting to settle into what this what's going to happen, now I have to see Snagglepuss go before the House on American Activities. I have to see his speech to McCarthy. I have to read that. And, and now I'm, I'm hooked. So uh, I'm going to give Snagglepuss a, a positive review this week. Not my favorite book of the week. Uh, I think my I think my pick of the week is still going to go to Batman because it's just such a beautiful issue and I I just love what Tom King's doing with that. But uh, yeah, I I really did I I dug I dug Snagglepuss. I you know it's it's not everybody's cup of tea. I'll tell you that right now. It's not for everybody. But uh, if you got an open mind and uh, you want to see some uh, like uh, fictionalized history and uh, kind of look at like what the, I mean this was a real time in our history. We really did have this. This uh, communism scare back then, and uh, and McCarthy was was dragging in actors and playwrights and everybody and dragging them before the House on Un-American Activities and grilling them about being a communist. I mean, this shit really happened in our history. It blacklisted so many actors. Yeah, so many people lost their jobs. I'm sure there were suicides. I'm sure there was like uh, people lost their livelihoods from this, and uh, it really was a really important and scary time in U.S. history. And if you're interested in any of that. Um, I would with... say I would almost say if you're a fan of the old Snagglepuss cartoon, this probably isn't for you because it's nothing like the Hanna Barbera cartoon. It's a really serious subject matter that's going on. Even though it's a pink lion and cartoon characters, the story is incredibly serious. Well, what's also interesting is how it's also kind of a parallel of what's going on now in our country with scares and things like that. Yeah, it's a, it plays on a lot of the paranoia and uh, and uh, political paranoia that's put out there by the media and the government and everybody. So, I mean, it really plays into uh, history and and current current things going on. So, I mean, if you're into that kind of shit and you're into some, uh, like, historical, you know, things like that, or, and you really want to get into, like, a, a serious storyline that's uh, about this kind of topic, I mean, if you're looking for laughs from Snagglepussness, you're not going to get any. Right. I mean, there's, there's obviously little humorous comedic breaks throughout but i mean it's not like you're taking a, a big hammer and hitting a guy on the head i mean it's not like it's not kooky slapstick comedy for, at all i mean this is a dead serious storyline but i actually i actually really like this one very good and then uh also since uh moving on i also read this week uh justice league which is the continuation of the uh the last issue where they thought that uh the, the townspeople, the poor townspeople, thought that the Justice League bypassed them and went to help the rich people first. And uh, that that isn't really what happened. And uh, an old guy in the last issue called Cyborg and said, hey, your, your Justice League buddies just blew right past us and went to the north to help the rich white people up there. And uh, so Cyborg beams down to find out what's going on. And he comes down and he's trying to explain to these people, he's like, no, the Justice League didn't bypass you for that reason. The Justice League bypassed you because a toxic cloud is about to blow from that area where this disaster happened is about to blow across everybody and kill everybody. So the Justice League went to handle the impending danger that was going to affect all of you. Hmm. So, I mean, that that was a little bit of a, 
I don't know that it was necessarily necessary, but then it starts this debate, you know, on like, you know, do we as Justice League, do we think we're more important than the people? Right. And do we think that 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 we are the the ultimate law and order, and and that we, you know, do you know, are we ignoring the small people to, and uh, and things like that, and even within their own ranks, like. Like most of the Justice League hold Superman on this pedestal like he is a god, and even the Justice League say, "Well, Clark, you know, they point to Clark like Clark is our savior, Clark is our god," and right. and, and Superman even comes into this and says, uh, "There's a really good line by Superman in this. I'm gonna try and find it real quick because it's it's pretty poignant to to, to who Superman is," and uh, and and Superman stays calm through all this and is trying to 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 help. Uh, Set things because they have to all work together because the Watchtower is now currently uh, falling out of orbit because of these the the fans these people that were super fans of the Justice League that somehow snuck into the uh, contracting crew that built the Watchtower and snuck all kind of backdoor programs and viruses into the Watchtower and they claim to be fans of the Justice League but they're they're fucking with the Justice League left and right in this arc and uh so the watchtower is currently falling out of orbit and they all have to work together to find a way to stop it from burning up and killing everybody and the debate is which of us is the most important of the justice league who can we not afford to lose that we can get out of here and have because they can only do so much like they said like uh the green lanterns could create uh they don't have a green lantern but they, this guy has like a, the ability to make hard light structures too that's with them and they said he, he can take a couple. Uh, Clark Clark's cape is is uh, fire is uh, indestructible. Clark's costume is indestructible. Clark could wrap two of us in his cloak or in his cape and and pull us through the atmosphere. But we've only got room for so many, and there's too many of us. On somebody has to stay here and die. Uh-huh. And Batman's most important. We know that. Well, I mean, and and they're saying, well, who who's most important? You know, is it is it the original? Justice Leaguers like Flash and Superman and Batman and Wonder Woman, should we get them off? You know, what What should we do? What's, I don't know why Clark would burn up anyway. <laughs> Clark, Clark should be fine. But, I mean, they're, they're all talking like who well, should Clark stay, who should Wonder go. Clark and Wonder Woman would probably be fine because Wonder Woman's, you know, indestructible for the most part. Well, I mean, but there's the thing is they're, they're like all, they're all kind of infighting and saying, look, you know, we need to, we need to pick, you know, we know it's not an ideal situation, but we need to pick who's going to survive this because not all of us are going to survive this. And the insistence of like the regular Justice League, some of them are like, uh, look, uh, basically Superman's like, look, we're all going to get off of this or none of us are going to get off of it. So we're going to do it the right way. And uh, Wonder Woman even says, no one is leaving you. No one. I will gladly stay behind in order for you all to survive. And uh, so Wonder Woman, like uh, the, the 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 original core Justice League, they got a bunch. They got a lot of younger heroes with them now that are joining the Justice League. Younger junior Justice League guys, like like well, like Killer Frost is fairly new to being a hero, and you've got a couple other guys that are in here within Batman's uh, JLA team, and like and and Lobo just splits on him. Lobo's uh, uh, Lobo's like indestructible in space. He can survive in space. He just says, "I'll see you later." And he just flies out. He takes off. But uh, the rest the rest of them are mostly human. But uh, the, uh, some of them are going to die if they stay there. But the the core Justice League kind of shows them, I think, what being a hero is. Because the core Justice League, Batman, Wonder Woman, Aquaman, Flash, Superman, they're all like, none of us will leave here. None of us will leave you. We will stay here and burn up with you if we can't fix this. Right. And they basically, so they kind of showed the younger JLA members and stuff. Like, this is how you be a hero. This is what a hero does. And uh, so what they basically do is they get the atom to shrink down to a microscopic size and go into the the watchtower computer and he's got to basically stop all these viruses and malware and weird shit that these guys put in the computer at the speed of light by hand. He's he's in the computer stopping different synapses and pulses and signals by hand just by stopping them with his hands and grabbing them. So they've done that. They decided to rupture the coolant tanks around the entire outside of the watchtower and then Killer Frost power is basically she converts heat energy into ice. So she can absorb all of the heat from reentry and basically ice up the watchtower as they fall. And it will freeze up and they will survive on the way into the atmosphere. So that, 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 it ends with that plan starting to take effect and you see the, uh, the Just League satellites starting to, the orbits decaying and the, 
the atmosphere is starting to burn it up, but there's this big crust of ice starting to form around the outside of it, and that's where the book leaves off. Okay. But uh, pretty good issue with Justice League. I'm kind of digging it. Um, I don't, I'm not sure. They just changed the – I think they just changed the team on that book, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know if that's Priest right in that one or not. Let me take a look at the cover. Uh, yeah, this is uh, this is Priest. He's uh, – He's uh, the new, I guess, I don't know how many issues back he started doing this. I guess a couple. But like I said, I'm, I'm so terrible at remembering creator names when it comes to like new, like new, like old ones I can, like old school guys I can tell in a minute. But I mean, some of these new guys like I'm not too familiar with, uh, it, it takes me a few issues to figure out who's writing and drawing everything. But uh, Justice League did really good, I think. I, I dig it. I was a little, I was wondering if, they, are they going to turn this into some kind of political message or something in the last issue? Like, like the Justice League doesn't like poor people or some shit like that, but I think that that they they turn that around pretty quick in the beginning of this issue, and then it mainly becomes about um what what it takes to be a real hero in the Justice League and and uh, and and showing the younger members what it what it means to sacrifice and to be a hero for the world. So I thought it was a pretty good one. Uh, I read Nightwing. Uh, you're probably reading this too, so you, I don't know if I, you want me to spoil it for you, but it deals with the judge and uh, what's going on with the judge in um, Bloodhaven. And, uh, and there's a gonna really cool. T- they're going to have to tie that one up because um, they got a new creative team that's going to be coming out on, uh, that's going to be taking over Nightwing very shortly. Yeah, there's a big explosion at the end of this, and and it leads you to think that maybe Nightwing didn't make it out, but you know, Nightwing made it out. Yeah. <laughs> so- that's not spoiling anything, really. I didn't think that would be too much of a spoiler. But the one thing I really did like about this issue is the first four pages. Uh, the judge is apparently trapped. He's tied Nightwing to a chair underwater. He's got him chained to a chair. And a big fucking uh, squid comes up to Nightwing while he's <laughs> in this chair. So he, he, pulls a, he pulls a Bruce move. He irritates the squid until it crushes him, uh, thereby crushing the wooden chair and freeing Nightwing. And he literally comes down to his last second of air before he's going to pass out. <laughs> and it works. He escapes, and he gets out. And uh, the very next scene is uh, Nightwing drying off of the towel, and he's literally covered with sucker marks all over his whole body from the squid holding on to him. Uh, but then it comes down to him just trying to find out where the where the judge is and uh, and going to find him. And, and uh, he's basically manipulated this guy into and blowing himself up. And uh, there's a big explosion at the end, and we don't know if Nightwing made it out. So, uh, to be continued the next issue. I guess it's, uh, yeah, this is chapter six of this arc mm. currently. Or the, ne- the, the next one, each, this is chapter five. Uh, the next one's called The Untouchable, chapter six, Deep Dive. So, yeah, this is a long arc. It's a, It's been a very long arc, and like I said, they got to wrap that up because they got a new creative team coming in that's going to take Nightwing in a new direction. Who's, uh, who's, who's doing it? I didn't even hear about that. Um, I put it out on Twitter. Was that the, the pre- was that the press release? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I know the channel. Uh, okay. The, that uh, Superman. Uh, I think this is the last one that I read. So uh, Superman, uh, really good. Uh, anybody into first appearances uh, needs to get this issue of Superman this week. This is uh, as far as I know. Um. I, I don't I don't recall seeing this since Jonathan Kent's been in the DC universe since Rebirth, uh, but as far as I know, this is the uh, first appearance of Boy Zaro. Hmm. We get to we get to see the Jonathan Kent Bizarro, and uh, what's funny to me is there's a it's an American Gothic. I guess the Bizarros are going to come to Earth because the show the cover is Bizarro with Bizarro Lois Lane and Boy Zaro and Bizarro Crypto and Bizarro Streaky are on the cover of this, and uh, Bizarro is saying farewell to Bizarro World on now, the cover. Now, is this going to be a and – and this is a different Bizarro than the one that's with Red Hood right now? Uh, this this must be, because this is Bizarro-verse. This is, a, a, this is actually Bizarro World, Bizarro, okay. the square planet in space. This is the opposite uh, Clark Kent, Lois Lane, and Jonathan Kent. And uh, it opens up with uh, – with uh, the Bizarro uh, on Bizarro World, and uh, they've actually got a, I think it's a tombstone for Jonathan Kent 
because they're backwards and they on his birth they put a grave out like a tombstone. I don't know, but he's had a grave in the beginning of it, and he's doing his backwards Bizarro talk like they like he traditionally always has, and um, uh, so he's on the Bizarro world and uh, Jonathan Kent at the same and it, it just shows some like Bizarro world antics like stuffs on fire and like like that's good like everything's backwards like it always traditionally was in the old Bizarro world stories right. But um, you get this uh, view of, of, of Boy Zorro, which is the Jonathan Kent Zorro. And uh, all of a sudden, Jonathan Kent and his friend, um, the girl from uh, Kathy, that's actually the alien that uh, was living next door to the Kents, uh, and her grandfather died. It was a big thing with um, a few issues, or uh, a few arcs back. But uh, she, uh, her grandfather died, so she is now living, because she's an alien, she's actually not a human girl, a little girl, <laughs> but she's an alien, and she's a friend of Jonathan Kent's, and they relate to each other, because they're both, basically, he's half alien, she's an alien. So they're, they hang out together, and she has, uh, her, her, her spacecraft is under her farmhouse, like buried underneath the house, and she has access to go down to it. So she takes Jonathan Kent down there, and they always hang out, like, the, like the, I guess everybody's aware, like Clark's aware of it, everybody's aware that this girl's an alien. And uh, they they keep an eye on her, but she lives by herself out in the farmhouse. And uh, Jonathan Kent goes to visit her when he gets a chance, and she shows him this technology in her ship where she could basically open up this bubble, like this like uh, protective bubble, but she can open it in different dimensions where they can see different dimensions. And she opens the dimension to the Bizarro world. And uh, Jonathan Kent and Boy Zaro like actually see each other through through this membrane of this energy bubble and they go to touch and there's a reaction that kind of blows them back and they, they shut down the machine and get out of there. And, uh, so basically, uh, Jonathan Kent goes home. It's like, yeah, um, they, they kind of call him out for going back to their, their old town without asking. He, he just went there and went to see his friend and they give him a bunch of shit. And, uh, then they start, uh, basically, uh, making fun of him, having a girlfriend and he gets all, you know, how, Younger kids get embarrassed, <laughs> so he starts cleaning up his cleaning up and doing his chores real fast to get the hell out of there. And uh, so later that night, Jonathan Kent's in bed, and then just all of a sudden, uh, Boy Zaro crashes through his bedroom window on top of his bed and says goodbye, like he would normally say hello. <laughs> he busts in the window and says goodbye to Jonathan Kent <laughs> immediately. So, and the next one's uh, the next issue's called Blood Brothers. So we're gonna see if. Uh, I don't know if, if just the uh, boy Zaro has come through and uh, Bizarro and Bizarro Lois Lane are going to come through looking for him or if they all were transported there through this energy bubble. This is just the beginning of this arc, so I don't know yet. Uh, but pretty good. I love uh, – I'm really disappointed. I, I, I'm not mad that Bendis is coming to DC, but I really wish they would leave this team on Superman because the rebirth Superman has been some of the best Superman in like 30 years. And introducing Jonathan Kent as the son and the Super Sons book with Damien. And I, I love both. I love Super Sons. That's a great book. I love uh, the crossover with uh, – I love the Super Sons arc with uh, Teen Titans and uh, Superman and and uh, Super Sons. That was a really cool arc. I love the team up of Jonathan Kent and Damien. It's really funny. It's really cool. It's got good artwork. Uh, I love this. And I just had this terrible fear that Bendis is going to come in and fuck this all up and ruin it. Because this this path they've set for uh, Superman being like the old school, you know, pre-crisis, old days Superman that he is. Right. Uh, I love what they're doing with this. I love the fact that he's settled down. I'm, I'm, it's great that he's got a family and he is just the down-home Clark with his son, teaching his son how to be a Superman. And uh, and it's I just love what's going on with it. And I just got this terrible feeling that, that Bendis is going to screw this all up. But, uh, yeah, Superman, I, I really dug it, number 42. Um, like I said, uh, as far as I know, and I could be wrong, they may have mentioned this somewhere earlier on in a different, like either in Super Sons or in somewhere in another book, they may have mentioned that there was a, in, maybe in uh, Red Hood and the Outlaws, I don't know. They may have mentioned that, that Bizarro had a son, or I don't know if this is actually the same Bizarro. But this this opens up on the Bizarro world, the square earth. So I'm assuming this is a different Bizarro than the one that's running around with Red Hood right now. But uh, really, really good. I love it. Like I said, uh, first appearance, as far as I know, of, of the Bizarro Jonathan Kent. So if you're into first appearances and you like Superman, maybe run out this Wednesday and uh, pick Superman 42 up. 
by uh, Gleason uh, Tomasi Sanchez. But uh, all in all, good week for books, man. Batman and Superman were, were tight. I like Snagglepuss. Nightwing was good. Justice League was good. All the ones I read were, were pretty damn good. Very awesome. And, of course, you can pick those up this Wednesday. And, of course, a slew of other books from other... Yeah. Batman's Batman. pick of the week, by the way. Batman's my pick of the week. Batman is the pick of the week. Nerd Rage pick of the week. Make sure you go out on Wednesday. Give the comic book some love. Give the comic shop some love. Pick up your books. we got to pick up our books. Yes. Uh, and, of course, we'll be back again next week with another batch of DC comic reviews. So, until then, yes, thank you all for tuning in, and good night. Good night, everybody. Nerd Rage Relegates